uh, hewn uh, a wall of stone there. They gathered in the circle and brought Peter and John in. And there stood the lame man in the room. And remember, there was nothing they could say because this man was lame. Everybody knew it for 40 years. He's been healed. What are you going to say about that? A miracle. <laughs> you know, it's like with Fisher. You know, you know, theoretically, when that car hit him and just the whole accident, he should be dead. He should be dead. God's still in the miracle business. You know what? He's still saving. And, and when here in the early church here, uh, they was uh, given the gift of to touch and heal the apostles. And this man here was healed and they couldn't do anything, but they said this, don't go teach in the name of Jesus. Don't speak, don't teach in the name of Jesus. Don't say anything. They threatened them in verse 21. And then they let them go, finding nothing of how they might punish them because the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. So, you know, they put them in a bad position here. What we gonna do? If we beat them, what are we going to beat them for? So they just threaten them. Now, we're living in a world today. Let's talk about our world today. And we say, well, we live in good old America here. We're, we're not threatened. But I'm telling you, the pressure's mounting. These organizations like the LGBTQ, they are coming against organizations, Christian organizations. You, you take this CNC Baptist Convention. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time before you see this on the news. Because they're going to come after those that's teaching and preaching Jesus. Those that's standing on the Word of God and, and, and say, no, God created a man and a woman to be married. That's a big issue. A man cannot have a baby. You see what I'm saying? All this crazy stuff is going on in our world right now. You know, I don't watch the news and I don't keep up with all uh, But, you know, I started reading last night. I, I was searching and looking at stuff on how Christians are persecuted in the United, uh, in the United States and around the world. It's sort of what's going on in the world today as far as uh, religion, Christianity, and the state of it. Now, so, so I'm going to share a few things with you today, and, and it's, we're going to go from this scripture here. Um, so it was in verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own company and re reported all that the chief priests had, and elders had said to them, and they went back to the church. And you remember that was uh, from the last message. And when they heard that they lifted up their voice unto God with one accord, they prayed. You remember we talked about that? We shared all that and said, Lord, thou art God which has made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in him. He's sovereign. God's sovereign. God, he's the creator God. That's what they're saying. But in verse 25, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? This scripture here is a parallel to Psalms chapter 2. If you go to Psalms chapter 2, you're going to see this basically is word for word. It just matches up. So I'm going to read to you in turn if you want to Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. And it says in verse 1, I'll give you a minute. Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. See, it sounds from, very familiar. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? It's, very, it's just a, a quote directly from that. And in verse 2, And the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Uh, you know, we think about that. He's, uh, the psalmist David here, they want, if what people want is to stamp out Christianity. They've always wanted it. They don't want nothing to do with Jesus. From the time uh, Christianity, the birth of the church here, what we're seeing here is that Judaism and the current leaders of that nation, they want to get rid of this. This is nothing but trouble. Don't think for a minute that in the United States, that very thought is still present. It's present in our government right now. It's present in the White House right now. They don't want nothing to do with Christianity, not biblical Christianity. They do not want you to go out and speak in the name of Jesus. Now, I told these boys, they're down there playing this basketball court. 
you know, in the church, it's time for us to get bold. Now, I'm telling you, and this is going to come from the Scripture here. You're going to see today what they prayed for. They prayed for boldness. They didn't pray, get me out of this situation. They prayed for boldness to speak. And I told Isaiah and them, you know, there's down there, there's Lacey, go down there, and there's a bunch of guys going back and forth on the court, playing and playing, you know, and they're, and they're cussing and, and vaping, and, and you can smell some of them drinking. Why should, and he said, well, he shouldn't be there. But, you know, God, we go down there to represent God, right? I've told Isaiah, it's not about the basketball. You go down to represent God. And I know sometimes we don't have to say anything. But, you know, sometimes we need to say something. We need to call them to prayer. We need to talk to them about their salvation. We need to say, hey, you hit a basket. Praise the Lord. What's wrong with saying praise the Lord when you hit a basket? You let them know that you're a Christian and not you're not ashamed of it. What the world wants, what Satan wants is us to be silent. That's the number one thing. If we're silent, you say, I'm going to be a silent Christian. And I know, I get it. You can live out your life. Sometimes you don't have to say a word. How you respond, you represent Christ. That all makes a difference. But God give you a voice too. He give me a voice. And I ain't going to be ashamed of Jesus. No, I may not be perfect. No, I may not live a perfect life. But if I'm going to see somebody, I'm going to take the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Threatened. There's going to come a day when you're threatened. Right now in your workplace, you go, you go up to your corporate office, you go in your corporate office, you start say, talking about Jesus, running around talking about Jesus, you see if you don't end up in the office. Okay? So you're going to be silent? What well, if it you your job? Well, say, wait, hey, Miss Bessie, or Bessie, Bessie, let's say Rick comes up to you. Bessie, you don't want to talk about Jesus no more. I don't want to hear that stuff in here. You ain't going to say it. If you say it, you're going to lose your job. I said, that ain't going to happen. Oh, yes, it's going to happen. These people in here, in the in scripture here, the Psalmist David, this is even a, he's, Psalmist David in chapter 2, is, it's a vision God's given him. He's, it's a vision of, of what's going to take place. They, they come up against his anointed one, that's Jesus. He's talking about, he's foretelling, talking about it. He's going to, he's going to, they're going to come against him. What did, who was the opposition to Jesus while he's here? It was always religious people. It wasn't Christians. The opposition will always come for, from, and they may even be under the name and say they're a Christian, but they're religious. They're not born again. The opposition came from those people, which was the leaders of Israel, the political leaders of Israel. That opposition came against Jesus. And it's for us today, we don't need to be naive in thinking. And I think the world, I think they've about pushed us, the church into silence anyway. How many people do you see witnessing the people out there? How many people do you see ever talking to somebody about Christ? I'm serious. You think about the past month. Now, we won't even talk about you. How many people have you been around? Has anybody approached you to tell you, to tell you about Jesus? Has anybody approached you? Anybody try to talk to you at gas pump? School? Huh. Walmart? You see what I'm saying? This is supposed to be a Christian nation. What are we doing? Walking around and assuming everybody's safe? Is that what we're doing? Everybody's good. You see what's happening. There's a silent Christianity in this, in this country. I told Isaiah, don't be ashamed. And he's not. He's not. Be bold, though. Listen, I'm not a person. I, I play basketball. And when I go out there, I play to win. Okay? I, I ain't playing to lose. We go out there and play. It might, it might get a little rough. But the other night, we prayed. That, the other night, we prayed that first night. We prayed after the game. And that was rough. We lost. Didn't I lose Isaiah? I lost him. I was on the losing team. I said, good game, guys. Let me pray. Let's pray. We all huddled up on that court. And it, 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 it wasn't that I didn't get preachy. I said, oh, we well, all think about one thing. We just think about eternity, heaven and hell. Would you think about your soul? Is what I said, Isaiah. I said, just think about it with mine. Would you consider Jesus? There's only one way to heaven. You know, listen, we've got to do it. 
Isaiah said, with the boys on his uh, school team, he wanted to take them and have a Bible study together. We've got to do that. We've got to speak. We can't be silent. Hey, we've got to get the word out. They told them, don't speak. Don't speak. Don't say nothing about Jesus. And, and in Psalms 2, he's just telling us what's going to happen. There's going to be opposition from, from world leaders. And we see that all around the world today. He said, well, nobody's getting killed here. I'm going to read you some numbers here in just a minute. There are people dying for the cause of Christ. He said in uh, verse uh, 6, And yet I have I set my king upon my holy hill in Zion. I will declare the decree unto the Lord has said unto me, verse 7, Thou art the son, this day have I begotten thee. That's even speaking foretell of Jesus on the cross there. He says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee uh, the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possessions. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest be he be angry and he uh, ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, but a little blessed are they that put their trust in him. That's the, the future king, Lord Jesus Christ. He, that verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. You know, he's given an order to the kings of, the, of, the, of the, that time that he served the Lord. They better fear the Lord. You see, he said, you see that, the wording, I break them as in potter's vessels, shattered into pieces. God's plan will take place despite what whatever Satan does. So Psalms 2, if you go back over to Acts, you see Peter just paralleling this. He said, who by the mouth of thy servant, David, why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. This was what happened. For a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, but Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. We'll stop right there. We just see David's vision in, uh, here in two. You know, Christianity today, this is just to give you a few numbers. You think about what's happening in our world today, okay? More than 5,600 Christians were killed for their faith last year. 5,600 Christians was killed for their faith last year. It says more than 2,100 churches were attacked and closed last year. More than 124,000 Christians were, were forcibly displaced from their homes because of their faith. Almost 15,000 became refugees. See, we don't think about that because we're living in a comfortable, comfortable America. You know, we don't see, nobody forced you out of your home because you're a Christian. But there's places that there is real physical persecution taking place and people are dying for the cause of Christ because they believe in Jesus. Not because they murdered somebody, but because they believe in Jesus. The early church here, we get Peter and him, we're going to see as you move forward in the book of Acts, they're going to get beat. For the cause of Christ. They're going to get whipped bad for the cause of Christ, for preaching the gospel, for telling people about Jesus. Now, in the workplace today, this is hit hard. I don't know, but in, in, especially in larger companies, they have policies now, right? They have policies. Everything's accepted, right? You know, we have to be careful about what we say, how we approach people. Don't we could lose our jobs? So we have to, we're going to have to make a decision real soon here. Am I going to be quiet and not say anything about Jesus or am I going to stand up? What if it's a 30 year pension on the line? Think about that, Mike. Before Mike left UPS, what did he come up and said, Okay, Mr. Mike, listen, I know you talk about Jesus around here, but our company policy, you can't be doing that no more. What are you going to do? You know, I really think across America, we've been taught not to say something. We've been, the church is silent. 
Let's see. Let's talk a little bit about persecution. Nigeria, India, China. Yeah, let's say some of these countries here. Uh, there's article after article where people are being murdered, where they're being uh, drug out of their houses. And, and it would do good for you to read some of this. The violence has driven more than 2 million people from their homes. Along with that has come increase of this lawlessness, kidnapping for ransom, has now become a major money earner in, in terrorist groups. And all of this, uh, while the numbers of victims of rape and people living in, uh, with disabilities due to uh, attacks continue to grow among Christian communities. Hundreds of thousands of children in these Christian villages are unable to go to school uh, or even get educa education. Nigeria and these countries here in India and China are hostile, that are very hostile. Uh, South Korea, North Korea, is very hostile against Christianity. There's, P, there's brothers. And see, we're all part of the same body of Christ. I know I don't talk about this a lot in the message because I, I don't really, it doesn't come up a lot. In, you know, but there are Christians that are being persecuted. They're being killed for the cause of Christ. And we're sitting over here in a comfortable church. They're having to hide to have services. And we, think, we don't think about it. So what we should do, we should pray. What if God called you to one of those countries? Would you go? Knowing that you're going into a hostile situation, China. Persecution is set to increase in China in 2023. We see that the country, they believe Christians will, uh, will come under even greater pressure in the coming year to demonstrate an unanswering allegiance to the premier, uh, whatever his name, instead of denying your Christian faith, pledge your allegiance to the leader of, of China. Pressuring people to do that. It'd be, like, it'd be like me and you say if we didn't believe what Biden believes and they come down here and say, listen, Mike, you, you, you're going to stop talking about Christianity. You're going to pledge your allegiance to the cause of Biden. You know, and that's, those, those are real things going on in real, in real countries. Uh, people are being targeted. They're facing charges. They're going to jail. Young people, teachers, parents, are told that religion will harm their education and they should report anyone involved in such activity. That's in China. So that's the, the and they have real, literally an underground church where they meet. So we see uh, Afghan, uh, Afghanistan is the same thing. I mean, you know, the, there's mounting pressure. There's the Muslim background and have a lot of concentration of Muslims and things like that, that, the, they persecuting Christians. Is it in this? It says pre pray, pray for converts who experience isolation, lack of Christian fellowship, and who struggle even to access a Bible. Even struggle to even get a Bible. I got five Bibles. You see? Do you see how comfortable we are? I mean, we are so comfortable. We've got this. I mean, I'm speaking to me too. I just got lazy. We won't even speak for Jesus. And that's what it's about. We're just so comfortable. These people are struggling, struggling to find a Bible. And that's like, I don't even know. I, I've never even, that thought ever crossed my mind, Betsy. I've had so many Bibles in my, in my family, sitting on the shelf. And they're, they're, they're what if you couldn't access the Word of God? You're Christian, you just got saved. You can't access the Word of God. Well, you know there's 20,000 people here in Jerusalem. There's not a Bible. There are Old Testaments out there. But you know that this New Testament is being, it's being printed right then before. They have the apostles and they're gathering together and teaching. And that's where, that's where the problem came. Because they're teaching Jesus. So this here. Challenges and opportunities. What lies ahead for the church state? Separation of church and state. Y'all ever hear that? Yeah. That's what they want. Uh, reproductive freedom. Will remain, it's going to remain a hot, hot issue. What does that mean? Abortion, right? It, you, you, it's been the controversy. It says Americans are not happy that the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. In every state where the issue has been on the ballot since then, reproductive, reproductive rights have won. Expect advocates to choose to keep uh, pushing that strategy. Groups are, that support the access to legal abortion, including Americans, American United will also be active in court 
there's, there's a constantly going to be a fight. Abortion is a church and state issue. And we'll continue to see that. This, this cause is overturned. They're not going to give up. Do you realize there, that's, there's an evil in this world that Satan's behind? So when we see these things, okay, Christian, uh, the Christian culture, there's continue to be war, conquerors, back and forth fighting, crookedness, corruption in the government. A nationwide wave of book banning will intensify. What's that? Speaking of culture wars, the nation is experiencing a, a tsunami of book banning in public schools and libraries. It shows no sign of abating in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. A teacher at a public junior high was subjected to a criminal investigation for merely having a copy of a book, Gender Queer, in her possession. I don't know what that is. She was not teaching it, and the class did not read it. Uh, so we're going to see, you'll continue to see this, this gender thing in the school, bringing things in, slipping things in, teaching things. We, we're going to continue to see these discrimination based on religion. Yeah, the LGBTQ, all these groups are very powerful groups. They're going to continue to indoctrinate our ch the children that's in the public school. Now, you know that's what this is about. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when they enter college, what do you think they're going to be thinking? Is, is, is Christianity on the decline? Is, you know, you think about these, uh, these uh, Christian, we say, well, we live in a Christian nation. We've always lived in a Christian nation. Pew Research. There's a lot of research out there. You see this, you go online and look at it. Pew Research, you see the numbers here. You see numbers of of what's going on in our world today. They've been keeping these numbers for a long time. Um, since the uh, 1990s, large numbers of Americans have left Christianity to join the growing ranks of U.S. adults who describe their religious identity as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. It's an accelerating trend. It's reshaping the U.S. religious landscape, leading many people to wonder what the future of religion in America might look like. What if Christians uh, keep leaving religion at the same rate observed in recent years? What if the pace of the religious switching continues to accelerate? What if switching were to stop, but other demographic trends continue, like uh, immigration, births, deaths, things like that? So the center estimates that in 2020, about 64% of Americans, including children, were Christian. Okay. So people who are religiously unaffiliated, sometimes called religious knowns, accounted for about 30% of those others. So there's a graph in here, just hypothetically. If people keep switching, young people are not, they're coming out of college, but they're not identifying as a Christian. Those that's been in church have gone to college, they're coming back out, and they're saying, I'm not a Christian. The numbers... If you look at, I was going to put it up this morning, there's a, there's a graph here. The Bible talks about a falling away, don't it? It'll, it'll reflect right back to the Scripture. The way to heaven is a narrow road, ain't it? We, for, we forget this thing. And then the road to hell is very broad. You will continue to see Christianity decline. Now, Christianity is, is really American. If you're going to identify as an American, you're a Christian. That's been, that's, been the, that's been the trend. Everybody knows that about America. But see, now we got the millennials, and you look at all the numbers. I, I don't care what, I, we don't have time to look at all this stuff this morning, but if you go look at all the graphs, you'll see that young people are leaving the house of God. They're not even identifying as a Christian anymore. And they, they account it to various reasons. Uh, hypocrites. Said church too judgmental of them. Things like that. But one thing is for sure, the numbers don't lie. COVID, COVID, churches hadn't recovered, guys. They have not recovered. 
and, and, and the doors. Now there's a huge church market, a real, a real estate market for churches. People want those buildings. So when they go vacant, boy, they take them to death get that, that church. I mean, this is actually, this going on in America, and, and they're happy to get that church. They're happy to see the doors closed. So what are we doing? We're silent. You can look at any of it. You look at all the numbers. You look at this. and say, losing their religion, why U.S. churches are on the decline. Now, it's a gosh, you can, this is getting depressing. <laughs> it's getting depressing. As the U.S. adjusts to an increasingly non-religious popula population, thousands of churches are closing each year. A figure that experts believe may have accelerated since COVID-19. The situation means some hard decisions for pastors who have to decide when a dwindling congregation is no longer sustainable. Hear me? But it has also created a booming market for those wanting to buy churches. With former houses of worship now finding new life. About 4,500 Protestant churches closed in 2019. 4,500 churches closed in 2019. So, well, this, uh, this, don't, this just don't sound good. But truly... If we look at it this morning, and we go back to the scripture in Acts, and we look at what's taking place here, they said, do not speak. Verse 26, the kings and the lords and all those are going to, they're going to be against, what is it saying? Against Christianity. Persecution. I want you to know this morning, they want you to be silent. They, Brittany, they do not want you to go into Walmart and approach another individual and try to strike up a conversation to tell them about Jesus. And you know what? The church ain't doing it. They ain't doing it on the corner. They're not doing it at work. But you go out and you try to tell somebody Jesus, and you know what's going to happen? Somebody's going to look at your life, and they're going to condemn you for what you're doing. But they ain't doing it. Why? Why aren't they doing it? They don't want to look bad. If you're out there telling people about Jesus, and they know they are supposed to be telling people about Jesus, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to find fault in you. That's what happens. They're going to find fault in you. Then you're going to stop? No. you got to have this mindset. Yep, no, I'm not perfect, Jill. But that's what I'm going to tell everybody I know about Jesus. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm not going to be quiet. Tell me stop? No, I ain't going to stop. Want to tell me quit preaching? No, I'm not going to quit preaching. This, this, is on, this goes on Facebook, guys. I mean, they can go look at the stuff and they say, you've been preaching against the government. You've been telling them to go out and tell people about Jesus. There's no denying it. What God commanded us to do? He said, go, go. What's happening right here? They're going. They're just telling people about Jesus. That's all they're doing. And they're getting threatened, they're getting condemned, and they're going to get beat just for telling people about Jesus. It's going to come from so-called friends. Why? Because this is going to make them real uncomfortable. You go out and tell somebody about Jesus, it's going to make so people get real uncomfortable. You go up and Christians, professing Christians get real uncomfortable. They do. They're like, what, what, what are you doing? They get real uncomfortable with those things. Listen, you got to be comfortable with your Savior. You got kids, right? Everybody got kids. This is my, this is my kid. He's here. Come here. Stand up. You know, when he's not around, you know what I do? I tell people about Isaiah. So, and I say, look at him. I'm going to hate to say this girl. He's a great guy. Yeah, I do. I, tell him, I brag on him. I brag on him. Why do I brag on him? Because I love him and I'm proud of him. I'm not ashamed of him. So why are we ashamed of Jesus? Why are we not talking about him like that? Yeah. Well, look, Betsy, Betsy will tell me about her dogs. Now, I'm not condemning Betsy, but if I go over here and talk to Betsy, 
And I, we could sit here probably for 20 minutes and talk about her dog. She'd tell me about it. Okay, she loves her dog. She's proud of it. All I'm saying is, why are we not doing that about Jesus? I mean, I'm, I'm proud to be a Christian. I'm, I'm proud Jesus is my elder brother. I'm proud that God is my father. Why are we letting the heathen run over us? They're raging against us, and we're, we're just dwindling now. We see in their, the political realm. You take somebody like Mark Robinson. Now, I, I know he, sit, he says to us that it, it might, might not be Christian, but he's talking about the Lord. Now he's running for governor. He's going to be in for a fight. And he's going to be in for a fight just simply because he's identifying as a Christian and because he's talking about Jesus. He's going into churches speaking about Jesus behind a pulpit. You talking about somebody's hated? Somebody's going to be condemned? Somebody's going to be threatened? His family? His wife? You put yourself in a position like that, uh, in the political position, and, and you're going to see a greater persecution. See, Peter and John was out there telling everybody about Jesus of Nazareth, and he, he was threatened in, in, in verse 8, verse 8, for to do whatsoever they, thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. It don't matter what they do. God is the sovereign God. And no man has power unless God give it to him. John 19, 11, Jesus answered, remember this, Thou couldst, couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given from thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath a greater sin. He said, listen, you wouldn't have no power at all. It's Jesus speaking unless God give it to you. Biden wouldn't be in office unless God put him there. He said he'd get political. Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Romans 13, 1. God put them in place. God says, and we see in the Old Testament, God says, David, you're going to be king. David's going to be king. Saul, you're not king no more. See, that's, that's God's sovereignty. Over there. God's sovereignty should bring peace to our lives. It should bring confidence. Now, I'm getting here somewhere. We serve a sovereign God. He's in control of all things. He created all things. He put everybody in power. So what does that mean for me as a Christian in my everyday life? It should be peace. Knowing my God's in control. It don't matter what you say. It don't matter what you do to me because God is in control. See, that's why Peter and John, and you'll see Paul and these guys, as they're being beaten, they're being, they're being drugged. Paul was beaten, left dead on the ground for the cause of Jesus. Why could, how could they do that? They knew God was sovereign. They knew God was in control of their lives. We're so wishy-washy. It's like, oh, man, I can't pay my bills. Is God in control? Now, God is in control of all things. Well, the, uh, the, the workplace down there, I'm going to lose my job if I talk about Jesus. God is in control of all things. Threatened? Condemned? They was. Look at what they prayed for, though. They didn't pray for God to get, hey, God, deliver me out of that situation. God, God, get me out of this situation. The sovereignty of God impacts everyday life. Just remember that. Brittany, when you go up there next week, now I know you told me you wasn't afraid, but you are. There's, there's, there's some, you just remember, you serve a sovereign God. God is in control. Your mom is wor worried. You go home and tell mom, listen, this is what you make. When you make this statement, God is in control, Mom. It's going to be okay. Why don't we speak with confidence? Why do we, why do we have so much doubt? God's in control. Listen, God's going to take care of my life. 
Listen, Mike, I have felt like God's been in control of my life from the time I was born. I look back now and I see his hand, how he worked, how he kept, how he provided. Listen, God hasn't let you down, has he? You see what I'm saying? God's been good to us. He's been merciful to us, church. But he's not going to let you down next week. Don't doubt. Believe. Have trust. Have faith. That's why the apostles could go out in the midst of opposition and, and when everybody else is against uh, Christianity and preach the gospel. Verse 29, and, and now, Lord, behold, they're threatening, grant thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word. See what he asked for? He didn't ask for Oh, God, deliver me out of the situation. Oh, God, would you please provide? He said, give me boldness to speak in the name of Jesus, to speak a word. That's what you pray for in school. Listen, we don't, you don't have to be ugly. You know, it's, the, it's those words that really pierce the heart, I believe, is when you say, would you consider Jesus as a Savior? Do you know Jesus died for you? I, I just think it's so, those statements that we get to speak sometimes out there. I know God's in it. Brittany, I met a little girl down at the uh, public place. And uh, uh, she said she was on the spectrum. It's AD, AC, autism, spectrum, okay? And I, and I know God put me there because all the rest of them had to go in there and pay, and I stood there. Very quick, very meek and mild. She went to talk first. But you know me, I'm persistent. How you doing? You know, hey, did you get where do you go to school? Are you, are you at Coastal University? I said, oh, you, you in college? Yeah, yeah. I said, what's you study? She said, I want to be a teacher and teach kids. She said, but I'm on the spectrum. I said, are you Christian? She said, I was raised Catholic. And you know, I know God's in this conversation. I said, you know, I told her about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus died for his sin. He died on the cross. And, you know, God's sovereignly in control. I said, you know, you can teach. You can teach those kids. You can impact those kids for the cause of Christ. And I really felt at that moment, God wanted me to tell her this. I said, God wants to do great things with your life. He wants to use you. And he can use you. It doesn't matter what situation. You say spectrum, it don't matter. God can use you. And I was in the conversation. She smiled real big. And they walked up. Yeah, I don't know what God did with that. But see, I'm not going to be silent. There's too many people out there hurting, guys. There's too many people out there hurting. There's people, people out there that's discouraged. God has called us to speak a word with boldness. Don't be, just, don't, hey, don't be timid. Friend, you go up there, you study, you equip yourself, and you stand up and you teach. You teach it with boldness. With all the authority of the, if Jesus himself were teaching it. That's right. You go out and witness in the same way. That guy David yesterday, if y'all hadn't went, if you hadn't took a Saturday, see God's so sovereign, ain't he? He put y'all, hope for humanity yesterday, put them exactly where God wanted them yesterday so that David could come and hear the gospel Somebody had to speak it. Somebody had to tell him. Somebody did so that he could be saved yesterday. See what I'm saying? God's sovereign. Wherever God places you, he's placed you there to speak with boldness. And I told him that. In the classroom, I'm going to build them boys at the soccer field, Fisher, if you're on a bass boat with your daddy, it don't matter. You may need to speak an encouraging word to him. Whatever, when God lays something on your heart, don't suppress it. Don't hide it. Go out with boldness and speak it. And that's what they prayed for. They said, God, give us boldness 
uh, hey, listen, the threats may come. We know, but we know you're sovereign. That's why they can have confidence in knowing God. Those that are part of the family of God can claim the promise. Romans 8, 28. You can claim the promise of, eight, of Romans 8, 28. And we know what? That all things work, all things or some things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what on what day is, is that all every day? You see what I'm saying? We are so wishy-washy, guys. I am so weak. I come and say for man, Miss Bessie, but I'm weak. Because I doubt God. He said all things is going to work together for good. You know, it don't look like it today. God, God. oh God, gosh, why did you put me here? God, I am such a whiner. Now I'm going to speak of me. You get to work, you complain. Monday, I'll probably be complaining tomorrow night. But you know, we say, say everything's as unto the Lord. Everything we do is as unto the Lord. We should say all things are going to work together for good for them that, hey, hmm, you love God? Right. To those that love God. And to those that love God, God has a purpose. And that's what that verse says. You're called according to his purpose. God has introduced you to CEF. He's equipping you. He's calling you to do something. Now listen, yeah, and that doesn't, Brittany, he's called every one of us to do something. He's gifted you to do something. But I, I think I, as of right now, I think everybody in this room can speak, right? There's nobody mute here. And then if you mute, you still got sign language, don't you? you tell somebody about Jesus. See, God is going to provide everything that we need. Church, don't, don't be intimidated by what's going on in this world. It's going to get worse. Christianity is not going to grow in popularity. Your workplace is going to get more difficult. You're going to be pressured to suppress the name of Jesus, to not speak in the name of Jesus. You're going to do, it's going to happen in Walmart. It's going to happen in your workplace. But I want to encourage you this morning. Don't be a silent Christian. Tell somebody. That's what the apostles hear. He said, by stretching forth with thine hand, uh, heal uh, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. You've got to speak the name of Jesus. You can talk about God all day long. You really can. You can have a conversation about God all day long. But when it will turn is when you say Jesus Christ is the Messiah. You say Jesus Christ is the only way. That's when the, that's when the, the eyebrow raised. They said, they said, and when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Amen. Church is what we need to do. I don't care where you go, Jill. Look for the opportunity. Just, it, it can be a kind word. It can be, they may, that, that may be a Christian. And, and they're having the worst day they've ever had. They could have got bad news yesterday. They got cancer. We don't know the heart of people. Stand with me this morning. <laughs> You say, well, yeah, it's a, it's a little different this morning. Christianity is, oh, listen, there's going to be a falling away. There's a narrow road. But the mission has not changed. 